Good evening, and thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Greg Fields. I'm the acting director of the Bonnie and Bill Stubblefield Institute for Civil Political Communications at Shepherd University. And it's my honor to welcome you tonight and to introduce the discussion that will follow. Since its establishment in 2019, the Stubblefield Institute has sought to provide a forum where divergent viewpoints could come together and address the most significant public issues with reason, civility, and mutual respect. And we will do that tonight. The standards, values, and ethics of every culture are captured by its history. How that history is conveyed to current and future generations forms the basis of our collective identity and our collective purpose. But history, as we've seen, is more than names, actions, and dates. History is context, an exploration of the impact of these past facts on present circumstances, and in the end, the navigation of the imperfections, the challenges, the successes, and the glories of a pluralistic society that is evolving year by year, and sometimes day by day, into new forms. How do we then translate this evolution to young people who were by nature impressionable and by temperament eager to absorb whatever wisdom their teachers can impart? We have tonight assembled a panel of diverse experiences and exceptional achievements to explore the nature of teaching the very history that defines us. And I'm pleased to introduce them to you now. Jonathan Butcher is the Will Skillman Fellow in Education at the Heritage Foundation and the author of Splintered, Critical Race Theory and the Progressive War on Truth. A regular commentator on education issues, his writings have appeared in the Wall Street Journal, Newsweek, and Forbes, among others. And he has appeared on various national media outlets, including C-SPAN and Fox News. He previously served as the Education Director at the Goldwater Institute, where he remains a senior fellow. Jonathan holds degrees from Furman University and the University of Arkansas. Chris Doyle teaches history at Avon Old Farm School in Avon, Connecticut. Prior to coming to Avon Old Farms, Chris served as Director of Global Studies at the Watkinson School in Hartford, Connecticut, and as Adjunct Professor of History at Trinity College. Among his many publications is the article, How Should Educators Handle the Movement to Rewrite High School History? Embrace it, which appeared in Education Week in July 2020. He holds degrees from Western Connecticut State University and Trinity College and a doctorate from the University of Connecticut. Dr. Yohuru Williams is Distinguished University Chair and Professor of History and founding director of the Racial Justice Initiative at the University of St. Thomas in Minneapolis, Minnesota. He is the author of several books, including Rethinking the Black Freedom Movement and Teaching Beyond the Textbook, Six Innovative Strategies. Dr. Williams has shared his views regularly as a contributor to various national media outlets, including ABC, CNN, The Today Show, and Fox News. He was featured in Ken Burns' documentary, Jackie Robinson, and the PBS documentary, The Black Panthers. He holds a doctorate from Howard University in Washington, DC. Chuck Yarborough has taught history at the Mississippi School for Science and Mathematics in Columbus, Mississippi since 1995. During that time, he has been recognized as Teacher of the Year by the Organization of American Historians, profiled in NPR's 50 Great Teacher Series, inducted into the Mississippi Hall of Master Teachers, received the designation of Mississippi's Outstanding History Teacher, and featured in the James and Deborah Fallows bestselling book, Our Towns, for innovative research and performance classroom projects. He holds degrees from Vanderbilt University and the University of Mississippi. You will have an opportunity to submit questions throughout the discussion. These questions will be viewed by our moderator and incorporated into the discussion as relevant and certainly uh, addressed at the end of the discussion. And our moderator tonight is Sarah Isger. Sarah is formerly a senior counsel to the Deputy Attorney General during the Russia investigation and Deputy Campaign Manager for Carly Fiorina's presidential campaign. She is also clerked for the Chief Judge of the U.S. Court of Appeals Fifth Circuit. Currently a professor at George Washington University School of Media and Public Affairs, Sarah is a regular contributor to ABC News as well as other media outlets, 
She's a graduate of Northwestern University and Harvard Law School. And so with great pleasure and immense respect, the Bonnie and Bill Stubblefield Institute presents an American conversation on teaching history. Thank you all so much for joining us. And thank you to our incredible panelists who uh, truly, I just want to uh, take you know each one of them and have a long conversation without any of you here, I would, I would be doing that. So, uh, so you're sort of getting to be voyeurs in like the conversation I've been wanting to have for months. Um, and so I want to approach this taking into account current events, obviously, but in some ways, how we talk about teaching history um, goes past anything that's happening right now. It is a conversation we have had throughout our history, throughout history. How do we think about it? And so I hope we can dive into some of those deeper issues tonight. Um, Chuck, I want to start with you. Why do taxpayers give their money to teach history in our public schools? And I want to give you sort of three paradigms, uh, and you obviously can reject all of them. Uh, a form of cultural literacy, right? It's just important to know that Columbus sailed across the ocean blue in 1492. Uh, to have educated future taxpayers to vote on future issues, a citizenry. Uh, to teach students how to approach learning. And history is just one way we do that, we do it through math, we do it through geography. Um, you were quoted as saying, we want simplicity in history. We want either good or bad, just or unjust, right or wrong. And while that's very satisfactory to us individually, any project in history that is going to reflect our world and teach kids how to operate in our world has to explore that complexity. And so I want you to combine those two thoughts the complexity of history, but why are we doing it? I'm sorry, I was muted. <laughs> <That's a worry. laughs> um, Always on Zoom. Well, thank you to the Stubblefield Institute for holding this panel. I'm really excited to be involved. Uh, the answer to your question is that we teach history because we have to. There is complexity in our story as a people, as people. And we've got to help our children understand the complexity of our current times and our future. And there's no better way in my mind to help empower them to do that than helping them to understand a more complete and complex past. Um, you know, one of my students in performance in 2019 reminded the audience in one of the projects we do that we all stand on the shoulders of those who came before us. And he was portraying a character from the 19th century that he had researched. And he said, I'd like to believe that you folks in the audience are standing on my shoulders. And I hope you will do likewise for those who follow you. To my way of thinking, that's why we're doing history. Ultimately, we're teaching young people to be critical thinkers, to gather evidence, to um, form connections between the evidence they have, and then to articulate their understanding of it, which will empower them moving forward. And most importantly, I think, empower them in their communities. And just as a quick follow up, I want you to explain a little bit about how you teach history and how that view of why we teach history informs something very unique that you do in your history class. Sure. Well, you know, of course, I'm teaching U.S. history classes and I'm teaching the state curriculum. But in order to make that come to life and really focus on the scholarly effort of, like I said, uncovering data, I'm exposing students to primary documents on a daily basis. And we do that through what I like to call research and performance projects, often in a cemetery where students are researching somebody from 19th or early 20th century Columbus, Mississippi, which is in the eastern part of the state, uncovering their story in their community and then presenting that to the public in some type of dramatic performance and projects we call Tales from the Crypt or the 8th of May Emancipation Celebration, all of which are really about exploring what I like to call more story, not just history, but more story, getting to the deepest, most complex aspects of what we can understand about our past. I have to say, when I read that, I wanted to attend, but also thought, boy, that would have been really hard for me in high school. And I'm sort of glad I wasn't in your class. I don't, that sounds, you know, really, talk about teaching people how to learn also. I mean, what an incredible skill you're teaching along the way. Um, it works. But clearly it works, <laughs> teacher of the year. Chris, I want to come to you next. Um, should we ditch textbooks? And I'm going to quote Chuck again, 
to you. Uh, reliance on textbooks, which compress complex events or individuals into one paragraph or page, is not an effective way to teach key moments in American history. I know you have your own experience teaching a five-week course on the Iraq and Afghanistan wars for your students after the AP exam is over, in which you obviously have to make up your own curriculum. Textbooks and standardized tests do that, though. They, they standardize to make sure every student is learning roughly the same stuff. Is there value to that? And if so, how do we do both? Or is it okay that some states may not have a clue what Marbury versus Madison is, but they'll really get Watergate? Um, thank you, that's a great question. And thanks Chuck for your answer. I, uh, I have tremendous respect for what you do in uh, public school. Um, I think that I, I have very ambivalent feelings about textbooks. Uh, it's not that there aren't any good ones. Uh, Eric Foner, the famous American historian at Columbia actually just um, last year sent me uh, his textbook. Uh, I think it's terrific. Um, <clears throat> the problem with textbooks often is that they, they take the human drama out of a story. And I think for many teachers, a textbook becomes a crutch. And what I mean by that is they feel that the textbook kind of pushes them around. It, it drives their instruction. It drives the themes of their instructions. I think well-trained teachers who are, are deeply backgrounded in American history or whatever their subject is, can teach really well using a, a textbook as an adjunct work or maybe not using one at all. Uh, I'd rather have my students read um, two or three really good monographs than read one textbook uh, in many classes, yeah. So, um, I have to say this, you know, I'm, I'm at the point in my career when I think it's a little bit more, a little bit less difficult for me to, to talk about jettisoning a textbook. When I was a young teacher, 23, 24, 25, right out of college, uh, textbooks provide a layer of security that maybe, you know, more experienced people just don't need as much. And to follow up on that a little, um... Our history keeps increasing, <laughs> obviously. And so how do you think about what to take out if we're now needing to add things like the Iraq and Afghanistan war? What can go and how do you decide? How do we decide? I think, yeah, I think that's a great question. Uh, teachers need to exercise some pacing discipline. Uh, it's a pretty simple thing to do. If you teach World Civ, which I'm doing now, we're, we're covering a lot more history than I would in an American history survey class. Uh, and, and I think how teachers and when teachers get stuck really do a disservice to the past. So I was thinking before I came on tonight about teaching civil rights. If I taught the black civil rights struggle and ended it in 1964, 65 with the Voting Rights Act or the Civil Rights Act of 64, it would be an uplifting story with a happy ending. If I taught that same history into the 1970s, the destruction of the Black Panthers by FBI and other law enforcement agencies, uh, a Supreme Court that retrenched substantially on Brown v. Board by passing decisions limiting the effect of uh, integrating schools, uh, the, the urban riots that characterized America in the late 60s and the early 70s, it's a much more complex, difficult, painful story to teach and I, I think it also sheds a lot of light on recent history. So I think this time discipline is really important. My goal for teaching a, a history class is, is to peel back the border between the past and the present. You know, I should be teaching right on the, the limits of contemporary issues in history. Uh, and Jonathan, coming to you now. The New York Times just had an interesting piece on book banning. And I do want to distinguish between banning books from a taught curriculum that students are forced to read versus banning books from even being available in the school library. Both are a problem, um, but they strike me as different problems. The Supreme Court had a case about this in 1982, and there was no majority opinion, which feels like that's what we're currently living in. Uh, lack of majority opinion. Uh, pluralities everywhere. Uh, so like so many questions in our modern era, whether abortion or mask policies, the question really is, who gets to decide? Uh, and so my question to you is, how do we balance a parent's interest uh, and their knowledge of their own child with a school board's political accountability, with a teacher's experience and knowledge of the subject, 
with a statewide or nationwide interest in uh, having an informed electorate um, and an informed citizenry like Chris was describing. So first, I think that decisions like that, just like decisions about how a market operates, can't be best decided by a centralized bureaucracy. And so that's why the Heritage Foundation and those that have advocated for school choice for many, many years have said that we need to give parents the ability to make choices about how and where their children learn for this very reason. When it comes to what parents realize or recognize their children are being exposed to in a classroom. So if a parent sees what their child learns and says, this neither lines up with my values, nor do I feel like this is going to prepare my child to be successful in the future, they should have the option and the ability to choose another place for their child to go. I think today there are some very encouraging proposals from lawmakers really around the country not to ban books, but simply to make the curriculum and the materials that are used in the classroom more transparent. The suggestion today, and I think the, the wise path forward, is to say that we should allow parents to see what the lesson plans, lists of textbooks, as well as other reading that's being presented to children is before it winds up on a child's desk. And I'll give you a quick anecdote, right? Why this is so important. A couple of years ago, there was a teacher who showed his class, I think it was a middle school class, and in social studies, a, uh, a comic strip that compared members of the KKK to the police. And when Governor Abbott realized this, only after the media put it in the press and it became a headline, and the governor saw it, the governor said, well, that teacher should be fired. So the real issue, though, is, you know, not only, I think, was the teacher not exposing children to ideas that were age appropriate, but also parents should have known about that before it happened. They shouldn't have had to wait to read it in the newspaper to understand what was being put before their children. So we don't have to take this all the way down the line to talking about whether or not there should be porn in an elementary school library to have a conversation, a very reasonable one to say that parents should have the ability to know what their children are being taught. Public schools are and were a part of the civic life in the communities in which they reside. And they should fulfill that responsibility by preparing their children, preparing their students to be active members of that public life once they're done. Uh, Yuhuru, I want to, to come to you now. Christopher, uh, Chris, sorry, opened one of his brilliant pieces with a basic question we have to answer before we can teach history. How do we even know what to believe? And he was talking about misinformation and disinformation that students are exposed to on the internet, TikTok, et cetera. But I wanna ask you the question at a more fundamental level first. We are constantly revising our own social norms, acceptable views on race and gender are different today than they were a hundred years ago. Acceptable views on sexual orientation or gender identification are different now than they were 20 years ago. And I always find it interesting to think about what we take for granted now that will be considered morally disturbing 50 years hence. So when we teach history, how do we deal with learning what happened without coloring it through our own modern lens? Should we be trying to teach without judging? And if we should be judging, whose judgment should we be using? It's such a great question on so many different levels, because I think the reality is that you're dealing with competing influences when we talk about um, history and at the core, what the teaching of history is meant to accomplish. No historian um, worth their salt will argue that they can recreate the past. We're not magicians. So the reality is all history is an imperfect recreation in some sense, uh, in, in some aspects, even an imagination of what happened in a space because we're not there. Um, and we offer a simple definition. History is a pattern coherent account of the past based on available evidence and intended to be true. And those are generally the metrics you're looking for to make sure that if you're in that space, generally speaking, people are comfortable with that. At the same time, we can't escape presentism. John Hope Franklin and Abraham Eisenstadt write in the opening to the American History series that every generation writes its own history for it tends to see the past in the foreshortened perspective of its own experience. 20 years ago or before 9-11, we never talked about, for example, the sinking of the Maine and the Spanish-American War as an act of terrorism. Post 9-11, we saw it through a very different lens and we talked about it differently. The other day, January 28th, we celebrated the, or marked, the comm commemorated the Challenger shuttle disaster. In the face of catastrophic failures of technology, we look back on that moment very differently. And a lot of people will recall the 
passionate language of Ronald Reagan in that moment, ask, talking about the astronauts uh, you know, slipping the surly bonds of Earth. They forget the part where Ronald Reagan said to the school children who are watching today, we have a responsibility to help you understand what you just saw. I think that's the impulse that we really want to focus on when we talk about what the purpose of teaching history is. It is this function of how you uh, live and really uh, show up in a participatory democracy. But at the same time, at the core, it's about doing exactly what Chuck um, was talking about earlier, um, exposing young people to the rich complexity of the American experience. It doesn't end just by talking about what happens with presidents. It's evident in uh, the um, accounts that we can glean from young people. Uh, it's interesting, we were talking about civil rights earlier, and I think that one of the things that uh, Chris brought up is talking about the civil rights movement. I like to capture those young voices. I wanna know what Melba Patella Beals felt at Little Rock in 1957, because my students can identify with her. And in the process, they can understand if she's writing in her diary from her book, uh, uh, Warriors Don't Cry, that this was the most important story the nation was focused on, and these nine children were at the center of it. And that's always been the American experience. It's not just what happens at the highest elective office, it's what happens among common people. All that to say, it's difficult, but it's important. And I think that's why we put so much emphasis on it. We really want to be in a space where we can reflect uh, the reality that, and to get to the core of your question, what the Supreme Court determined in the case of Trot versus Dulles, talking about capital punishment. They argued in that case that punishment in our society should mark the progress evolving standards of decency that mark the progress of a maturing society. History should do the same thing. And Chris, I wanna have you react a little to what Yohuro just said. Uh, should we be starting by teaching kids about the present, especially when we think about teaching our racial history in this moment, um, instead of sort of diving into slavery or even the 1619 project, do we need to start with why we're talking about that now and why we think of it differently, why it's an urgent question that we're having? As I, as I heard Yohoro speaking, what I took from his message is that every generation thinking about its own moment projects some of that into the past and the questions that we ask of the past change. Um, and, and that's appropriate, you know? Uh, the, the problem with being presentist and he wasn't, he wasn't suggesting presentism as a, as a method of teaching history. The problem with being presentist is you need to avoid anachronism. That is, you, you can't ahistorically project our own values back into the past, right? So on a certain level, we have to try to take the past on its own terms. Um, if you take an issue like slavery, a, a very, and, and racism, you know, obviously something that's on people's minds today, in part as a result of the 1619 project. Um, I, I think this is a moving target as a historian. Um, it would be one thing to say that, you know, one of the first things Columbus did when he came to the Americas was to enslave people. That, that's a fact, right? To pass judgment on that is a little more complicated when you're talking about Columbus because there was nothing in his world that said that slavery was problematic. Uh, now in Thomas Jefferson's day, it's quite a different story. You have a transatlantic debate on the merits and demerits of slavery. It's become a moral problem for Thomas Jefferson, right? And you know that's when you can kind of parse Jefferson's discussion of slavery and the notes on Virginia, his use of language in the Declaration of Independence, his relationship with Sally Hemings, and, and that can lead to like a really powerful classroom discussion about is Jefferson a hypocrite? Is he just a tyrant? Is he a tortured soul? Is he a, a, a great man who can see a future beyond slavery long after he's dead? Um, those are fascinating discussions, um, but, but you have to try to have those based on your own moment without completely succumbing to anachronism and presentism. Ugh. I could spend a whole hour and a half just on that answer, and maybe we will. Uh, <laughs> um, Chuck, I, I want you to respond to that a little, um, as well as the transparency question uh, that Jonathan was talking about. Um, can you, will you, you know, if a, if a parent asks, like, I want to see your curriculum for the semester, do you have an objection to that? If so, how to fit in um, sort of what Chris is talking about, about having this, this presentism 
in looking backward as well, are parents a hindrance, I guess, to some of what you're undertaking? Now, in my experience, parents aren't a hindrance. Um, you know, I'm happy to share what I'm doing in the classroom and what we're dealing with, because ultimately, and I agree with Jonathan's statement, schools are about community. You know, our schools have to help us build community in every community in this nation. So parents are part of my school community. I'm absolutely going to communicate with them and answer questions and do so respectfully and expect respectful courtesy back. That, in my experience, has not been an issue. Um, now, as far as um, what Chris and Yahura were just speaking about, yeah, it is that the great challenge for young people is to help them to understand that studying the past is um, as difficult as studying a foreign country that we have never been to and do not speak the language for. There is a, a great danger in people seeing in the past something that is identical to today. And that's not empowering, that's disempowering to my way of thinking. It's, uh, it's you know, it's, it's um, diluting yourself <laughs> to some extent. So I think in classrooms, we're, you know, we're using documents to go beyond textbooks to explore the themes and the values that are evident in our history. And, uh, and that, that works. Um, and I, I, the cautionary tale that Chris just uh, presented us is spot on, I would say. Jonathan, I'm going to steal uh, Chris's Columbus versus Thomas Jefferson thing. I hadn't thought about it. I feel like I'm in an amazing history class right now. Um, you obviously have some objections or some uh, differences on how we inculcate that next generation into our history. I'm curious how you see the presentism problem. I think what's important to recognize as well as the shortcomings and the failings of those that were, you know, we were just talking about in the past is also the promise and the hope of why America is the last best hope for both democracy and freedom and opportunity. Um, you know, not only do we have the those who failed to live up to our creeds, some of those who even wrote those creeds, but we also, and I'm persuaded by Sean Wilentz's argument that abolitionist politics originated in the United States. I mean, this was a, a, a constitutional republic with a democratic system that was self-correcting. It allowed for individuals to be replaced when voters were not happy with what was being passed. It allowed for culture to change. I mean, the ultimate one of the ultimate representations of cultural uh, change and cultural warfare is when you go to the, to the ballot box. And so we have a system that allowed for leaders to come into place to change those ideas and those institutions that were in fact systemically racist like slavery and like the Jim Crow era. And so that is one of the things that separates the United States. And that's the lesson that I believe is being lost. It's being lost through things such as the 1619 Project and, and others. Yuhuru, what do you think about that balance? Are we striking the right balance between the good versus the bad versus I don't know. I mean, history doesn't see things through good and bad. So let me rephrase that a little. Are we striking the right balance between um, the facts, the part of our history, which is promising the experiment that we have been undertaking versus the failed promises, the promises that we didn't live up to along the way? Are we, are we striking the right balance in either direction? It's interesting because if you listen to the political debate today, you'll hear a lot of people argue that we're not. But the reality is if you talk to educators, I spent um, Saturday afternoon with educators in Florida, uh, teachers across this country who have been doing that for a long time and doing it by anchoring their lessons in conversations about core democratic values, which are articulated in Jefferson's moment, which we don't live up to. But our constitutional enterprise has really been this work of working toward perfecting our democracy. I mentioned Challenger earlier. There's seven crew members uh, who were aboard on that ill-fated day. If we think about the experience of them, it's an affirmation of progress in America. There's Ellison Okazuna, person of uh, Asian ancestry. There's Ronald McNair, who's African-American. There's Krista McAuliffe, the first teacher in space, Judith Resnick, Dick Scobie. They are uh, literally a blueprint of American society and culture in that moment. It was um, really their stories, if we want to delve into it, talk about this as a hopeful moment. If you don't know anything about the uh, discriminatory actions uh, and laws against Asian Americans in this country, it's hard to appreciate the power of that moment. If you don't talk about 
uh, the discriminatory practices, Jim Crow, slavery, toward African-Americans, it's hard to appreciate the power of that moment. If we don't know anything about the treatment of women in this country, it's hard to appreciate the power of that moment. We're a work in progress. In order to really help young people understand their role in a participatory democracy, we have to show the ugly as well as the hopeful. And if we get focused so singularly on, let's just talk about the good things that happen, we miss part of that complexity that is Pat Bigley in a wonderful cartoon about Muhammad Ali uh, in 2016 produced. You know, Ali was the greatest not because he was the champ, he was the greatest because he was always the challenger. We're a society of challengers. And the reality is that it's those who've challenged inequality and who've recognized in reading and studying history what challenges remain, who've always helped us move forward as a democracy. Sarah, uh, can, I, can I jump in please. on this, Sarah? Yes. Um, I think this is a, a fascinating line of discussion. And to get back to what Jonathan said, um, I think that Jonathan's statement would be something I would want to historicize in the class and let my students discuss. Jonathan's making an argument. Jonathan, I have you correct. Tell me if I don't. Your argument is that the American system of government created by the Constitution extended through the amendments of the constitutional process and worked out in a democratic tradition that goes back almost 250 years, that that has created a kind of American exceptionalism, that we have this kind of self-correcting system in which democracy inevitably flows from. And, and I think that if you take American exceptionalism to its, its largest conclusion, the conclusion might be that America is different and normal rules of history don't apply here. And, and that's the point I'd like to historicize with students. It's, it's, is America subject to the same kind of problems and dynamics of other countries throughout history, or are we just fundamentally different? And I think that, I think that would be a terrific debate. And, you know, I think that's still an open question. Um, I think there is something exceptional in the American political system, but I'm not sure personally, I would, I would land on the, the idea that therefore we can tell a, a story of continuous American progress and that's how to teach American history. I think it's more complicated than that. And, and that would be something I would, I would kind of step back from and have students discuss. Jonathan, I wanna let you answer, but also um, get back to my, question that I asked at the beginning, which is the purpose of teaching history. Is part of the purpose of teaching history, in your view, um, citizenry? And if so, then regardless of, um, I'm going to get an F in, in uh, Chris's history class now, regardless of sort of the epistemological truth of the question, teaching students that America is exceptional would have its own value when, if the purpose is to create a citizenry. Jonathan. So one of the things that I wrote in my book is that if you just put superhero capes on the founding fathers and called it called it a day, you would be shortchanging everyone, right? I mean, that's not the story. And I also think when I talk about, Amer you know, when I'm referring to this idea of American exceptionalism, um, I don't think it's that the rules of history don't apply. Rather, I think it's that the United States was the first, I think, to set up this system that allowed for this correction that I think has a lasting value to it or something that will last. Um, it's not perfect. History is not linear, right? We're not just simply progressing and getting better, right? I think, you know, we go in concentric circles and we have Venn diagrams of, of good and bad. And I think that that's one of the reasons in which that we're wrestling with all of these ideas today, because I think some people will look at the mainstream media and look at what's in the news and say, boy, we've just taken steps backward. And I, I don't think that's the case. I, I, I think that part of the reason that people are looking, seeing these things on television and the toppling of statues and spraying 1619 and all that, right? I don't, that's not, that is, that's not a um, display of um, uh, not only how a republic and our republic should function, uh, I think it, it actually is trampling and trying to tear apart what is also a theme of my book, which is that we need to have a um, common set of ideas that we can then communicate across, right? Part of what's happening now is that the very uh, fundamental ideas on which our country is based, we're using different words to describe them. We're using different ideas to describe 
uh, the past and we're calling America different things like systemically racist today, despite the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And that's pulling and not just creating attention, but literally pulling apart communities and, and governments and states and, and, uh, and people and families. And so I think that what we need to you know, one of the purposes to ask, answer your question now um, of the purpose of teaching history is I think we need to have a common um, set of ideas on which we can talk about the past. We need to agree on a certain set of ideas in order to build the bigger ideas to understand the present. I actually am going to grab a question from the Q&A just because it fits in so nicely with what we're saying from Tim Bowers. Um, Chuck, to you, uh, about indoctrination, I, I would use the term inculcation. <laughs> so, I want to read his question and then tweak it a little per moderator privilege. Um, as history was taught in the Soviet Union and in Nazi Germany, it was an unmitigated indoctrination into a specific political viewpoint. How can we recognize the infiltration of indoctrination into historical instruction and how can we guard against that? And actually, I guess I would change it and say, Chuck, isn't all teaching history in school inculcation into something? Um, we don't teach I think the United States, as if we don't live here, United States history, we teach United States history very much as if we live here. Certainly there are AP exams reflect the fact that we are Americans thinking about American history. Where is the line between indoctrination a la Soviet Union, Nazi Germany, we can all sort of put that on the bad side, versus inculcation of our values and our history as a means of, as Jonathan would put it, right? Um, those concentric circles and the experiment that we are undertaking, which is unique in history. How, how should we think about that line? Chuck, I don't hear you. I'm sorry, I'm a terrible right. pun leader. <laughs> <laughs> Terribly deficient. <laughs> well, first of all, I think part of the, um, the, the genesis of questions like this, uh, well-intentioned, I think, but sometimes uh, I think the public considers history taught in schools as if there is only one history class taught one year and there's not consideration of the rest of the world, which of course there is. I teach American history, I teach uh, African-American history and I teach Mississippi courses uh, and American government. At the core of those, I'm focusing on historical events, but I'm also focusing on core American values as expressed in our founding documents and expressed throughout our nation's story. And I think that the reason that I try to get at complexity is to avoid indoctrinization, I would say, because too much of our story is told from the perspective of a narrow group of people who have um, fully exhibited the core values of the nation. My students have taught me that through primary document inquiry, what they're finding is, of course, that all Americans have exhibited these values. And we have so many people in our national story who have been victims of real oppression, uh, real injustice, but they've not been defined by victimhood. They have been people who have continued to strive and exhibit in all of the best ways those core American values of hope, of equality, of, of, of striving for bettering their communities and themselves. So I don't, I, I don't know where the line would be. I, I, I know there is one obviously, but I'm, I, I just haven't seen it in the classrooms I've been in, my own as well as other people's classrooms. Wouldn't Vladimir Putin listen to what you just said and say, that is indoctrination. You're just indoctrinating them into a different set of values than we have here in post-Soviet Russia. Part of your indoctrination is, as you said, America's values, and then the fact that you haven't always lived up to them. That's, I mean, it's part of the indoctrination can be um, a sort of weird self-loathingness at times, uh, which America has always, I mean, you can go look at the Federalist Papers and right, like the, <laughs> there's a certain amount of uh, hair suit that they all like to wear. Um, and, and so, yeah, I mean, how is that different? Well, I, I would say it's different because, uh, again, we're trying to get at the full complexity with an honest, not self-loathing, I would think, it's honesty about our collective past, uh, getting beyond the narrowly uh, often memorialized version of our story, which has been defined by a few, and we're trying to offer, or at least I think my students are finding, 
there are more voices to contribute to completing that story. Yuhuru, um, you teach college. Uh, college students are, uh, you know, 18 to 23, 24 these days, 17 maybe. Big difference between that and third graders, for instance. Big difference between third graders and sixth graders and ninth graders and 12th graders. I mean, those ages um, before you get to college, every year is sort of a revelation in who you are, who you want to be. You're reinventing yourself. I definitely had, you know, the Eddie Vedder uh, Pearl Jam necklace um, in sixth grade and thought that was the coolest with my Doc Martens. Um, and then by, you know, college, I'm in a pixie cut and talking about David Foster Wallace. So what is too young for some of these conversations? Because some of what I think parents are saying is I know my kid and you're describing the horrors of slavery to my eight-year-old and they are simply not prepared for that. And then the pushback I hear is, on the, on the one hand, racism is an everyday experience for all sorts of eight-year-olds across the country. And so we need to discuss how we got there. But also, you know, we can talk about slavery in a way that's eight-year-old appropriate. And so I think some of the angst that people are feeling along that spectrum is that's actually a harder question than either side is making it out to be of the people who are on sides. How can we meet that difficulty acknowledging the difficulty of it? Uh, well, a couple of things. I think first and foremost, we have to distinguish between civics education and history. And I think Chuck and Chris are unique in the fact that if you look at their um, works and you look at their classrooms, they're actually teaching history or inquiry, critical thinking. But there are also educators who are charged with the task of teaching civics. And that is, you know, again, all it pivots around notions associated with participatory democracy. We understand that. I think part of the challenge is that the reality is that when you talk about transparency in a curriculum, and we certainly want that, this is a question of who decides. So who ultimately is going to be that body that makes the determination that this is the canon and this isn't the canon? And we forget sometimes in this moment of people kind of reacting against um, the full monster of CRT that for years, and I certainly um, lived through this, there were uh, books in our uh, classrooms in our school libraries that denigrated the experience of indigenous people, of African Americans, of women. Um, Tyndall Indians for a long time sat in schools uh, unchallenged, uncontested, no voices to balance that. Uh, books like Mark Twain, who was considered part of the canon for a long time, which denigrated the experience of African Americans, used language which would be problematic today. And no one stood up and said, we're doing harm to these young people by growing up in, an, in a school environment where their experience is not reflected um, in a way that would be affirmative of their participation in a larger society and culture. We have mentioned CRT. I, I will take seriously what you shared with us in the beginning. For me, CR, there's another CRT. It's called culturally responsive teaching. It's what Chuck is doing by saying, I teach in Mississippi. I teach Mississippi history. I want my uh, uh, students to understand the, the society and culture through the lens of Mississippi history and what's the material culture here that people hear. I'm in St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, we have a large Somali and Hmong population. It's important to reflect the experience of those people in the classroom. They have been part of the American story. And so if we're not making the effort to be reflective of that in the larger conversation about history, we do them a disservice. Last but not least, I think this is kind of critical to this conversation as well. We talk about core democratic values, but the reality is you take an organization like the National Council for the Social Studies, which puts out its core democratic values for elementary students. The reality is American core democratic values are not to be found in Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution. You're not going to find them there. You're going to find them in the aspirational language of the preamble. We the people. What does that mean? It meant something Oh, in 1789, it meant something very different in 1830, something very different in 1865 with the 13th Amendment, something very different with the passage of the um, 19th Amendment and women's suffrage. It's evolving. And when we take that tack that, you know, Chris and, and Chuck are talking about by equipping young people to think critically, we're empowering them to really be part of the conversation about what that evolution looks like. That's the most important thing. That's the best thing that we can equip them that, with in, in today's society. I want to follow up really quickly on something you said. You're referring to Agatha Christie with Ten Little Indians. Yep. Um, so I, it was one of my favorite books, but it was called And Then There Were None when I read it. Um, I think they changed the title quite intentionally sort of in that genre in which I was reading it. Uh, are you saying that Huck Finn 
and Agatha Christie's book shouldn't be part of the canon, shouldn't be in schools, or that they should be part of the canon, but we should acknowledge why it's problematic that they're part of the canon. I just wanted to push on that a little bit. I'm glad you did, because we're in a moment now where people are trying to ban Beloved and Mouse from the curriculum. And I'm saying that, you know, uh, I went to school where those books were part of the canon. They were never problematized. I'm not saying that they should be taken out of the canon. I think we should provide context. We should, you know, in the same way that Chris was describing how th this is the problem with pre presentism. In that moment, people didn't understand why that was problematic. They, they may not have understood the dimensions because that was the norm in that moment. There's tremendous power in our contemporary moment to teach people about why that's harmful and potentially the damage that does by not applying our current um, kind of standards to that, but by looking at that and its complexity from that moment. But you have to provide context. I think in a way, when you have people today saying, you know, get rid of Toni Morrison because we don't want to hear about slavery or we don't want to talk about the Holocaust, something that's fundamentally insidious about the fact that for years, no one cared that in communities of color in particular, um, those two, even something as innocuous for some people as Nancy Drew, uh, I, I challenge the audience, go look through the Nancy Drew unabrogated, um, you know, all kinds of problematic language um, that young people were exposed to. And the question is, if we're evolving as a society, at which, what point do we look back and say, let's put some context around us and then let's be very intentional about the way that we're helping young people understand why this is an issue. Jonathan, I wanna shift just a little because uh, in some ways it feels like the adults are arguing over whether to have steak tartare or caviar with dinner and the kids are over there eating Totino's pizza rolls. Uh, Chris wrote about this in Teaching in a Post-Literate Age. Uh, he was quoting Philip Roth, so I'm like quoting Chris, quoting Philip Roth. Uh, the movie screen was the beginning, the television screen, and now the coup de grace, the computer screen. I think it's important for the audience to understand the more fundamental challenges because before we argue about what we should teach, we kind of have to have a better understanding of this moment that they're in, that we did not, we were not in, we are not in. Uh, and so Jonathan, I'm wondering how that works into your views on how we think about education, who's teaching the role of the Department of Education or anything else. If these kids are like, ha ha, y'all are arguing over books. I don't know how to find a book in the library. Cool. Uh, so, I mean, this moment is, uh, I mean, it's its certainly unique, right? We had, before COVID set in, there were a couple hundred thousand, in some cases, uh, in, around the country, students who had chosen virtual learning, right? We had virtual charter schools in states around the U.S. They, they picked it, though. They chose that for various reasons. Either they were homebound, they were uh, active athletes, they were, um, on, you know, for whatever reason, unable or chose not to be a part of the traditional mainstream classroom. But that was their choice. When the pandemic struck, very quickly, we had to just we had we had to make a decision very quickly. Do we just pause everything and not not do anything at all? And there was some discussion about that. I don't know if folks remember back in March 2020. You know, there was some thought of well, let's just stop and not do anything at all, or do we try to find a way to create an online platform that will at least try to mimic to the degree that we can something for students to create continuity? And I would argue that, uh, well, I mean, let's, let's just say this. What's happened since is that the rate of the share of children earning Ds and Fs has frankly exploded all over the country in districts large and small, from my little town here in upstate South Carolina to uh, Los Angeles, to Chicago, Philadelphia, and, and lots of places in between. So yes, we're at a point right now where families who uh, chose an assigned school and had no other options are seeing really things are, are crumbling and it's quite scary. I'll give you a couple of quick data points. Uh, Eric Hanushek wrote for OECD, uh, the Organization for uh, Economic Cooperation and Development, an international organization that does research, that based on the long-term prolonged, uh, unstable, really, virtual learning platforms, that students could see a 3% decrease in their lifetime earnings because of what's happening in school today. There was a, a study for NBER, the National Bureau of, Bureau of Economic Research recently, that said that the uh, math scores were down by anywhere from 10 to 14 percentage points, uh, larger for those students who were in only virtual situations longer than those who went back in person. So to answer your question, yes, it is a bit frightening right now. I mean, uh, I'll, I'll close with, with this, with this with, on this question, but imagine if you were a kindergartner in 2020, that child would be entering second grade right now. And in a city like Chicago, they never 
would have had a normal full year of in-person learning. Imagine if you were a ninth grader in 2020, you'd be a junior almost getting ready to finish your high school experience and it would have been the same. Uh, Chuck, let me give you a, a provocative version of this, which is, should we be ditching teaching history and instead teaching literacy books, book learning? Uh, you know, as, as Chris was describing it, you know, his students don't know how to do internet research, but they also think that there's only internet research and don't think that there's knowledge in books. Is, is this conversation we're having pointless because they don't know how to find the information to begin with? No, <laughs> I'm done. Good. No, no. <laughs> um, no, you know, and of course, students are reading books in classes and good teachers are challenging them to go into depth, finding context if it's literature, finding primary documents if it's history, and comparing those to their current situations to build a better future or better understanding or, or ability to navigate the future. Ultimately, the goal of all education, in my opinion, is to empower people. So if we are teaching students how to read at whatever level they are, get them where they are and build them from there, we're doing something important for our society and for our communities. And there is a civic aspect to that. You know, uh, that, That's part of what my job is. I'm a high school teacher. I'm trying to build communities one student at a time. And you know, and I've, um, I've often been blamed to overquote this quote from Mother Teresa that you know, there are no great acts or small acts performed with great faith. And I think that's what every good teacher is doing. We're saving the world one child at a time. And yes, they're learning to read and they are reading and we're teaching them to read and how to be critical thinkers with what they are engaging in text. Um, Chris, you have written about uh, mental health issues among your students. And I was uniquely interested to ask you this question. 70% of high school valedictorians are now girls. 60% of college applicants are girls. So sorry, 60% of college students are girls. Uh, the trend by almost any metric is that men are boys are stagnating or have already fallen behind? Is there anything that we're doing when it comes to teaching history or as we're in some ways changing how we teach history um, that contributes to this or to ask another way, is it the process by which we teach? Sit there quietly at your desk, process more of the emotional aspects of history, less who fought who, that maybe the boys were more into. Um, and are we, you know, does that mean that our, our teaching Overall, but I want to obviously focus on history with you guys. Is it too geared toward women? Well, first, um, I want to congratulate you for asking really good questions all night tonight. Um, and I'm glad I didn't get some of the other panelists' questions because uh, I don't know I don't know how to teach third graders or how deep to go with any of them. Um, I teach in an all boys school, you know, and so my students are high school freshmen to post grads, so they're range in age from 14 to 19. And, um, you know, I, I think, first of all, I, I would say we do not have a female centered history curriculum. It's, it's quite the opposite. And to go back to the textbook issue, women usually get those little boxes on the side of the page, the sidebar boxes, you know, and then you'll, you'll hear about like, you know, some famous woman inventor or, you know, some famous, some uh, obscure first lady. Um, I think it's even worse than that, Mike, I feel like, sometimes, because it's like, you know, Mrs. Coolidge had a raccoon. Isn't that neat, kid? Yeah, and you're like, yeah, what? Right. How does that, huh? <laughs> I, I think to, to try to answer your question directly, actually, you know, in, a, in an all-boys school, I feel more of an imperative to teach about women in history and, and women's um, concerns in history. Um, you know, I, I always teach Margaret Sanger and the birth control crusade in my U.S. history class. And, you know, I, I don't teach in public schools anymore, but I, I taught it in public school too. Jonathan would probably be angry that, about that, but, uh, you know, uh, it, it's in my curriculum. It's in my syllabus. I, I, I teach Margaret Sanger. I teach Betty Friedan. I, I think you have to. Um, regarding what works for my students at the moment, um, it, it's the kind of stuff that Chuck does. It's, it's project-oriented, uh, allowing students to 
engage in research on subjects that they find intrinsically interesting. It's um, portfolios of their learning. Uh, it, it's letting them stand up and teach the class. It's letting them engage in debates. Uh, I, I think the big challenge for teachers is to ask the right questions, structure the right assignments, and then get out of the way. Uh, and, you know, my classes are an hour long, right? So imagine if you have like 15, 14 year old boys in your class and it's right before lunch. You know, if I'm going to try to sit, stand up and give them a lecture, it's, it's just not going to work, right? So, um, you know, the, the, the interactive nature of the class is, is kind of key for me. And if I'm not doing that, I'm, I'm dead in the water. Uh, Greg, I want to pick on our, uh, our host for this evening. I feel like you picked too good of teachers uh, and it's detracting from our ability to have a more interesting discussion. We need lazier teachers to, to talk to tonight. Um, I want to go back and take these high school classes. This, I mean, this sounds so advanced and fascinating. I want to switch now to some questions we've gotten from the audience. Um, so from Marie, what do you think of the legislation in several states, including West Virginia, to stop divisive issues from being raised by teachers or state historic agencies? Are you familiar with the specific limitations? And Jonathan, I actually want to ask this to you to start with. Sure. So I disagree with the idea that uh, provisions in state legislation that says um, you shall not include in a course of study. Uh, some, sometimes that phrase has been found recently in some of the proposals that have been considered uh, around the country. What is important to me is that we protect both teachers and students from racial discrimination. And so the heritage model, which is available on our website, says no individual shall be compelled to affirm or profess or believe any idea that violates the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And that's including the idea that someone should receive an additional benefit or sanction or punishment based on the color of their skin. And so this is what affinity groups, essentially, especially mandatory affinity groups, uh, that's the kind of situation that it puts individuals in. And so we should be protecting individuals from having to affirm some idea that violates not only their most deeply held beliefs, but also a foundational law, the Civil Rights Act, that is evidence of America's self-correcting mechanism that we were talking about before. Yuhuru, I want you to respond to that same question. Oh, muted. Couple of things to that. I, you know, I, I really have to push back on this notion of, of America's self-correcting mechanism. The reality is that it's self-correcting when people push it to be self-correcting. And the reality is that the history um, that we teach in our classrooms bears that out. Um, this is what Christopher Eisgruber writes about when he says that American society aspires to be most, both democratic and just, and that places a heavy burden on the American people. But the reality is that when we move in the right direction, it's generally because people are forcing us to live up to that aspirational language that I talked about in the very beginning. Um, I also think it's problematic for, you know, it's just kind of interesting. It's a perversion in some sense of the language and the spirit of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which was fought against so bitterly and contested so bitterly, um, now to be used uh, as a means to say that we shouldn't have a curriculum that's reflective of the broader experience of uh, people of color in this country. Um, I think that that's, you know, the, the whole uh, hullabaloo over critical race theory is problematic because the reality is not even taught in K-12 education, and that's the truth. Uh, I, I'm really kind of disturbed to hear people say that so consistently when the reality is that really what you're talking about are innovative teachers like Chris and Chuck, who are just taking the time to make sure that they are fast uh, creating units that allow students to do that deep historical thinking that we're talking about. But to take a statement like Jonathan just made and interrogate it, is that really what's happening? Is that where we are? Um, and that really is the essence of critical thinking. One last thing, I, I wanted to respond to something that got said earlier that I think is just important. You know, the really reality is, and Chris's writings bear this out, teachers are first responders. We really need to stop pretending that teaching happens in a vacuum. When your child goes to school after a catastrophic, catastrophic event like 9-11, or Hurricane Katrina, or the challenge or disaster, who's one of the first adults that's gonna help them make sense of that moment? And so to argue that we have to, you know, be look, peering at the teacher's classrooms and questioning at every moment what they're doing without recognizing the complexity of the job that they do, um, as, as uh, you know, Chuck said, you know, really um, having to work with young people, um, you, you get 30 kids in the class, the reality is that they have questions. 
And we can't pretend that those questions are going to just go away uh, because we mandate that teachers, you know, not talk about certain things. The reality is that teachers are first responders. We need to give them the same respect. We need to treat them with the same professional courtesy. We need to give them the same trust that we, you hear some people articulate for police and fire and so on and so in the military, you know, um, thank a teacher, support a teacher, uh, and, and, and be in a space where we recognize the important work that they do. Chuck, uh, sorry, Chris, could you teach in a public school and do exactly what you're doing? It would depend on the school. Um, in, in some schools I could, I, you know, I've been following the state laws, um, uh, that make teaching controversial subjects uh, difficult or impossible. I don't think I could be a public school teacher in Oklahoma right now, because the Say rule more. there, yeah. the rule there is that uh, if students are quote made to feel guilty for being white, or if they are made to feel uncomfortable by teaching sensitive issues, a teacher can lose his or her teaching license for that. So, you know, Education Week has been following this very, very closely. Uh, the reality is laws like that are having a dramatic chilling effect. Uh, you know, there was, a, there was a case back in the fall in South Lake, Texas, where teachers there were instructed uh, in the South Lake School District that they needed to teach, quote, alternative perspectives on any controversial issue in, involving race. And they, they were explicitly telling teachers that included the Holocaust. So I don't know how you could teach alternative perspectives on the Holocaust. Um, does that either mean that you're going to give uh, time to the arguments of Holocaust deniers, or are you gonna dig into uh, you know, Nazi propaganda and rhetoric about the, why this was necessary? You know, if, if your history curriculum can't take a definitive stand on an issue like the Holocaust, then it's not really good for anything. Uh, and, and that kind of chilling effect is, is going to strangle discourse and discussion and argumentation and complexity very, very quickly. So I, I don't think I could teach in an environment like that. I wanna push you on one thing, which is some of what you were describing in that Oklahoma law sounds similar in a different strain to some of the speech codes we've seen pop up on college campuses that are coming from the other direction, that if a student says something that makes yeah. another student feel offended, um, it feels like there is illiberalism popping up on yes. both sides of the political spectrum or whatever yes. spectrum you want to call it. Yes. And I'm curious how you see yes. those interacting. If on the one hand, we don't want students when they're in college to feel unsafe or to feel offended, but in yes. high school, we want to offend them. That feels, if nothing else, backward, though, I would say backward in several respects. Yeah, so I, I think the popular expression for what you're talking about is cancel culture. And look, I, I think you're right. This comes from different sides of the political spectrum. One side does not have a monopoly on, on inhibiting free expression. Uh, this, this is a problem in our culture right now, for sure. Uh, and it does have a chilling effect. We, we had a, a, a African-American studies professor at Duke visit us for Martin Luther King Day last week. And he, he gave a session for teachers. Uh, I had a lot to talk to him about. Uh, you know, he's feeling at Duke a chilling effect. Um, there, are, there are books that he won't touch now with students that he used to touch. Um, you know, there. Uh, I, I was, when I was a younger teacher, uh, a very good historian uh, came out with a, a book that was a pictorial history of lynching. I, I actually used to show two of those photos in my American history classes like 25 years ago. One was a postcard of a lynching and it was sent through the mail. And, and the author of this postcard had circled his face in the crowd and then circled the hanging lynched person and said, I was right up into the action here. It was great. Wish you had been here. And this, this to me, I showed this to suggest the kind of casual nature of racial violence in the early 20th century. I, I would not use pictures like that anymore. I, I think it's, it's a different world right now. And it's, um, you know, maybe, maybe um, I, I just think it would be, it would be asking for trouble. And I, I just wouldn't do that anymore. Um, 
And, and I think this is problematic. And it gets back to what we were talking about regarding books in the canon and libraries. Um, I, I'm a big advocate of free expression. You know, I, I would have, if, if you're going to have Mein Kampf in the library, have Mein Kampf in the library. You know, I think students could read Plato's Republic and come away from that with kind of proto-fascist views. And then I think you'd have to try to talk them out of it. But, but, don't, but don't forbid them from reading these things, you know? Um, Love the I, idea I that think, students are just on their own picking up Plato's Republic from the library, though. Like, yeah. honestly, yeah, that at that point, happens. we've already yeah. won. So uh, they're <laughs> yeah, fine if happens. they're doing that. Right. Yeah. Uh, Chris, uh, sorry, Chuck, um, I, what is the perspective of some of your students on this? Do you talk to them about illiberalism popping up uh, across the board, what it feels like to be a high school student in this moment, trying to learn history, but also trying to figure out their place in the present moment? Well, interestingly, um, it, not their place that they we've had discussions about. They're concerned about me. I've had students asking me if I am, uh, you know, essentially under assault in my classroom by outside forces of some kind, which I'm not, to, for the record. Okay, but I do think there's a potentially chilling effect, as Chris described. And you know, I don't know about the rest of the country, but in Mississippi, we're in the midst of a teacher shortage. And I can't imagine that trying to, uh, you know, villainize uh, teachers for trying to challenge students to think is going to end well as far as providing for our kids. And in, in our state, of course, we're typically very near the bottom of all the good lists and near the top of all the bad lists. And, uh, and, and we're doing everything we can to turn that around as generations of well-meaning Mississippians have. Um, by the same token, my young people in my classrooms recognize that stifling discourse is not where they want to be. It's not where they want to go. And um, so I, I, don't, you know, I don't know. I haven't asked the question. That, in fact, I'm probably going to ask it tomorrow now that you've asked it. Of me. <laughs> so I'll report back. <laughs> Are you hearing from parents? Are they concerned? I have not heard from parents, uh, although that was the question. I don't mean concerned about you or what you're teaching. I mean concerned about sort of the general illiberalism or, hey, we heard that other states are, you know, banning you from talking about things. So is that well, happening here? Mississippi is, a, we just passed, our state legislature passed some legislation that sounds very similar to what Jonathan had presented. And, um, and there was a hearing at our Department of Education last week, and the clip that has been uh, sent you know, constantly rebroadcast as a member of the public saying, why would you want to teach people something that will divide them instead of bring them together? And what I find is that when students um, get to engage and interpret a more complete story, that they end up coming together. Uh, they, they have a better understanding of one another in their communities, and that's empowering. So I, I, I don't fully understand that view, although I know it's out there. Uh, Jonathan, a question from Carolyn. Uh, as a former teacher, I can tell you that not a single parent has ever asked to review curriculum material. Don't you think it is uh, ingenuous to expect parents to decide what will be taught? Who is the history expert? Carolyn, I will say that um, <laughs> maybe it's just because of the current moment, right? But I have had my friends who have older children than I do sending me curriculum stuff all the time. One of them sent me He's reading, he read his son's history book, actually, and was sending me all of the little side things that, um, that Chris was describing that generally are like women. Uh, and he was like, what is this? <laughs> uh, so certainly parents are diving in now, I would argue, though, um, Jonathan, I think that part of why that question interests me, especially if you could touch on it, is that the parents who are going to be asking to review the curriculum are frankly a very specific set of parents. Either highly engaged in their kid's education, which is like that kid's already doing fine, right? That kid's gonna be just fine in life if their parents wanna read their history textbook overnight as, as my friend uh, did. Um, or they're going to be on those political extremes because they want to find problems in the curriculum, which may not be that productive. And the parents who are least likely to engage is sort of a silent majority, if you will, who want their kids to learn history. They don't really wanna be part of the Fox News or the MSNBC debate. 
definitely want to have some 1776 in there. It'd be great if you could mention, um, you know, Ronald Reagan was president at some point, but anything in between that, as long as you're hitting the high points, they're fine. And so is part of your transparency, is there a problem with that? And that it's actually going to further the extremes, feed the extremes. Well, I think that the surveys that I've seen that ask parents some of the questions that you were describing there of what they want taught do reflect in high numbers. I mean, these are surveys that Heritage has done, surveys that um, I've seen Rasmussen do and others that says that parents do want the full story of history taught. They do want um, uh, the ideas of uh, America as a land of freedom and opportunity taught as well. And they uh, it's are pretty... Um, uh, it's unpop. The ideas that I have seen that are unpopular are the ideas that condemn America or say that America is defined only by its past. So start there. I think that the survey showed that Americans, uh, that parents do want a full history taught, and they don't like the idea that students are being taught that America is a land of hopelessness. I would say too that the fastest growing segment of the public school population in the US are charter school families. And these are families that choose a public school for their child. These are schools that can create their own curriculum, that can choose uh, what they teach and uh, largely for the most part and how they teach it. And some of these charter schools are schools that choose a classical curriculum. They choose to teach the classics. I know of a fast growing network in Arizona, for example, that spread from Arizona to Texas and beyond with just such a curriculum. Uh, I would also add that- over When you say the classics, will you tell us what that means a little? Sure, so uh, not only are they teaching, uh, we talked about Plato earlier and, uh, and things from uh, uh, Greek, his, uh, you know, Greek classics, as well as uh, the history of uh, uh, classic works from philosophy, but also the core works of America and America's identity. I mean, from, you know, Huck Finn uh, and beyond. Um, and they not only do they teach those things, they list it on their website. They list everything that they teach, all their books on their website. And so these are the places that again, it's the fastest growing sector of the public school population right now, or has been for many years. Uh, I would just finish by saying that the, uh, the share of, uh, or the percent, the percentage of families who are choosing to homeschool over the pandemic has, according to the best reports, doubled. Uh, in some places like Texas, you're seeing increases of 400% or more. So I would argue that it, I don't think that it's a silent majority necessarily, nor do I think it's, it's um, uh, only the parents who were highly involved in their child's education before the pandemic. I think it's parents who see a problem now and who recognize now that what's being taught in a public school or what's being shown in the media doesn't reflect their personal values. Yuhuru, Jonathan's brought up charter school several times, and I'm wondering what you think is the future of public education in this country? Are we going to move away from uh, you know, zip code based schools? And when we think about the teaching of history, if you're choosing your history teacher, are you choosing your history? Is there something divisive about that? You know, when I, when I started, one of the questions I asked was about textbooks. We can all crap on textbooks all day long, believe you me. I have you know, nothing positive to say about them except for standardization is not all bad. Um, having a shared history is part of what makes us American versus not American, right? Borders and shared history, those might be the only two things. Um, and so what should we think about public schools, homeschooling, charter schools, and the future of education post-pandemic when it comes to teaching history? Americans need to make a deep investment in public education. The reality is that the charter school conversation is also fraught with issues that deny the racial history associated with charter schools. Uh, they grew up in response to integration. And the reality is that in our contemporary moment, when we look at suspension rates, when we look at, for example, some of the things that even Jonathan was celebrating, you know, teaching the classical canon, what does that mean? It means you're not going to get Toni Morrison, you're not going to get Frederick Douglass, you're not going to get W.E.B. Du Bois, you're not going to get anything that's even um, remotely reflective of the kind of non-white uh, supremacists. And I use that language intentionally here because that's part of the critique is that that canon reifies whiteness. It does in no way invite conversations that deepen beyond the experience of kind of great white men. And that's problematic. It doesn't say that we don't celebrate the contribution of all Americans. It says we have to explore and deepen that. In New York City public schools, they speak 800 languages. How is it fair then that you have a curriculum that doesn't reflect the experience of the diverse groups of people who make up that city, that make up that school district. 
we don't want to go back to 1981. This is not the age of E.D. Hirsch and cultural literacy, where we come up with a list of 500 terms that every American should know, and then quickly discover in the creation of that list what we're excluding and what's driving that exclusion, which I tell you will be race and gender and class and fear of, and homophobia and a host of other things that at this moment in our republic, I think we need to be thinking very intentionally about dealing with in a way that, and, and I want to privilege this in a way that Chris talked about it, because I think it's very important. Elevates conversation so that we recognize this uh, education as a community enterprise. And the reality is that when we see ugly incidents like the killing of George Floyd, and I mentioned that again intentionally because when I was in Florida, this became national news last week, there was a teacher who had included as part of a presentation a picture of Colin Kaepernick and the district canceled the professional development. We don't think the kids are seeing Colin Kaepernick on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and the many other portals that they have access to and, and to the wider society. So we're gonna run from that in the classroom, the one space where we have an opportunity to help them see and make sense of and make meaning of that. That to me seems wrongheaded. It seems um, you know, uh, anti-intellectual. And I agree that it happens on both sides. I don't support it when it happens in either place, but the reality is that you know, that's really what we wanna empower educators to do is to help young people make sense of that complexity. Uh, a question coming in from Facebook, uh, and Chris, I'm giving this one to you. Should parents' personal values guide teaching? Wouldn't that delay school integration from Damon Wright? And I, I assume that he means wouldn't that have delayed school integration if we had taken parents' personal values as a guide to teaching? Um, Chris, what are your thoughts on, on how to factor in parents? Personal views maybe isn't a term that I would use, parents' knowledge of their own kids, parents' version of what things, you know, we talk about um, the, the, how history keeps growing, right? Either we become more superficial in order to hit it all, or we're going to have to exclude, you know, become more superficial on some things so that we can add depth to others. Should parents have a role in deciding what things to add depth to, in part because of what Yohuru said, right? The Hmong population in Minneapolis, you may want to add depth to some things differently than down in Mississippi, and the parents are part of what's going to inform which things you're going to be able to add weight to and which things you're going to have to let float up to the top a little bit and be like, that happened, moving on. So what Yuhuro and Chuck and Jonathan have been talking about have to do with constituency and agency. Who has a voice in what gets taught? And you actually raised a, kind of a sub question there, which is we have a shared history, shouldn't it be the same everywhere? Uh, in my experience, every place I've taught history, especially American history, I've, I've subtly or not so subtly modified my teaching depending on the constituency of students. I just told you that in an all boys school, I, I make sure that they get taught women's history um, because I think we're already pretty male centric. Uh, if I were teaching American history at Pine Ridge in South Dakota, and all of my students were Native American Sioux, um, I would imagine that that would be a radically different experience for me as a teacher than if I were teaching in Harlem, or if I were teaching in a, a suburb of Hartford, Connecticut, which is where I am right now. So the audiences and the constituencies matter. Parents matter. They certainly do. Chuck's 100% right. Um, if you get a phone call from a parent, and they, they have a question about your teaching, uh, you, you have to speak to the parent. And I would, I would say, as Chuck did, that you know, the vast majority of conversations I've had with parents have been very, very positive. When somebody's concerned enough to call, then that, that shows interest. And, and you, you want to work with the parent and you want to explain to the parent I would love it if parents would want to come in and sit in on a class. It would mortify their kids. So they, they wouldn't want to do that very often, except for parents day. But, um, um, you know, if I, I, I take real care with my syllabi, my syllabi is kind of a, um, a, a measure of transparency. It's very detailed about what I teach, what sources I'm asking students to read, how I assess them. Uh, you know, Chuck has state standards that he's responsible to. Um, 
you know, I, I know Uhura as a college professor would would also turn his syllabus and say, this is it. You know, it's kind of on the college level, it's kind of a contract with his students. And and that's exactly the way I try to make it, too. So, you know, I agree with with all the panelists that a parent constituency matters. Um, a syllabus is really important. And and your curricular is very important, too. Um, that said, I, I don't think it's possible to teach a single history to every every town or city in the country. I, I think that would be a standardization ad absurdum. I, I think that's too, too great a degree of abstraction. Jonathan, agree or disagree? On the one hand, if we just taught Plato to everyone, we'd have standardization. And on the other hand, teaching Plato to you know, children of uh, the Sioux tribe versus in Columbus, Mississippi versus in Minneapolis, um, students could get a lot more out of it, I'd imagine, if you're hearing from parents on what they think their student needs to teach. And, and clearly you're obviously in favor of hearing from parents more. What if those parents don't want Plato? What if they want a more specific historical education for their students? Well, I think because we have families in different communities living together who have you know, either similar backgrounds or ethnicities, it's all the more reason that they should be able to choose where their child goes to school. I mean, what if they're living right on the other side of a line that would separate them from an assigned school where there is a, a high concentration of students who are like their own, right? I mean, you want totally to Totally fair on the charter school front, but just because we're running out of time a little, I want to talk about like just the history curriculum and you know, on the one hand, we want parents involved um, because as you said, like some of the things the parents don't want taught, um, they're objectionable or to your point about, you know, racial distinctions happening in class. But on the other hand, sometimes the parents are going to say, um, you know, our students are Native American. When we talk about American history, it would be silliness to only read the Federalist Papers. That misses a core part of our family's experience. Sure. So I think that they should cover more than the Federalist Papers and more than Plato's Republic, for that matter. I mean, I think like what was someone said earlier, I don't remember if it was uh, Chris or, or or not, but it was that um, there is more than just one history class that a child takes in their K through 12 experience. So I think there's reason to expect that we should be exposing them at age appropriate levels to different ideas from the past so that when they're older, they can be exposed to the more intense questions about the imperfections of American history and be able to look back and see those who were heroic while at the same time recognize that there is no perfect hero, uh, but it's not enough to condemn them. Um, uh, I, you know, I think if there was one thing that I would hope to leave from history or leave a history class with is that students should have something to aspire to. We should be giving them something that is aspirational for themselves. There is no perfect story, but they must be given hope that the American dream belongs to them and can be theirs and can be theirs in the future. Chris, uh, I want you and Yohuro to uh, respond to a question from uh, Stephanie Slocum Schaefer. Um, in my experience, the self-censorship that goes on in a university level classroom is far more insidious and harmful than anything coming from the outside. Many students are afraid to share their opinions publicly. I see the influence of social disapprobation uh, as the worst kind of cancel culture. And I'm wondering if these teachers uh, believe the same thing is happening in high schools and middle schools. Do you feel like your boys are censoring self-censoring um i i think it depends on the on the dynamics of a class um i i i'm a big believer in a diverse classroom uh i mean ethnic diversity in the classroom um it's very difficult to have a discussion about race when everybody in the class is white and the teacher is white um it it gets, I, I'm also fine with silence. I think if you sit with a question for a while and you just let it percolate, you'll start to get answers. Um, I, I think the best discussions I've had with students are, are diverse classrooms. Again, I've, I've asked a, a, a probing question or two and then I get out of the way and, and I'm fine with silence, um, but, but it, it's a little bit like therapy, you know, like, like it, it's in fits and starts. And, um, you know, the, the tougher the questions get, the, the more you have to be measured 
and, and try to model the kind of discourse that you want from students. You know, I, I, I'd love to have students see a, a session like this. You know, obviously um, there are disagreements among the panelists, but we're listening to each other and we're, we're responding to each other and we're doing it civilly, you know? So I, I wanna thank the university for, for creating this because uh, this is a, a model for the kind of classroom environment that I'd like to have. Chuck, and have you experienced, oh, apologies. Yeah. Chuck, have you experienced a student saying something that offended another student or, you know, the, for me, it's, it's so hard because these students are struggling with what they believe. And part of, at least for me, figuring that out was saying things out loud, feeling it on like a sweater and being like, do I believe that? And so you need to give room for students to say things that are incorrect in our current cultural moment. How do you provide that space for your students in Mississippi, and, where I assume these conversations are tough? Well, they are tough. And, and Chris brought up uh, that, you know, there's a parental constituency and that's important, but there's an important, more important constituency in every classroom and that's your children. The kids that are in that classroom have to feel safe enough to do exactly what you're describing, Sarah, which is to question themselves and question each other and feel empowered to offer a critique, not of the person, but of the ideas that are being expressed. And, to, and you've got to model that. You've, you've got to challenge students to ask one another, what makes you believe that? And I think that's a fundamental skill that students are drawing out of historical inquiry. That's the question we're asking of the documents. What do these mean? And how can we gain further understanding? So, so yeah, it, it's, a, it's a challenge, but ultimately that's what decent teachers are doing all across the country. And, and, you know, and, and this is where the idea of uh, having someone outside of the classrooms come in and dissect every moment in a classroom is really problematic for teachers because that uh, it, it betrays a fundamental trust that teachers and students have to develop for one another and within that environment. And ultimately that's the only way we're gonna, that, that's the only way they will develop into the young leaders we need them to be. All right, so Yuhuru, they come from Chris and Chuck to you. <laughs> um, you are in some ways in some ways getting the best view of what's going on in high school history curriculums, what's missing, what's working. Um, if you were advising the high school teacher that all of your kids had, let's say they all, you know, all of your kids had come from the same high school teacher, um, what would you tell that teacher that they're doing right, right now? And what would you tell that teacher that's not working right now as you're trying to teach your students? It's a little unfair for me because I haven't taught four or five years. I was in an administrative role and then I teach law classes, which are very different. Um, what I would say, though, is in my interactions with undergraduates, I find that they're far more savvy than students were maybe a generation ago. And I applaud some of the things that are happening in um, particularly high school um, education today because they're much more adept at reading primary sources. These are not, there was a time, uh, Chris, I know you know this, uh, when you would introduce a primary source and to students and they would had never seen it before because everything was driven by textbooks. You have so many educators now who are comfortable with helping students deal with the complexity of really just tearing a document part, apart and thinking critically about it. At the same time, I, I wanna echo what um, Chris said and, and uh, Jonathan as well. The challenge in this moment for us is to create a space where the best minds are thinking about how to create spaces like this that we're doing tonight, where we can appreciate the skill and uh, of an argument, uh, the ability of the person who's making that argument and, res and respectfully disagree. And I think that's where we now with cancel culture on one extreme and what we're seeing on the other extreme, we've moved away from a space where the safe space used to be what uh, Justice Holmes and Justice Brandeis talked about in the Abrams case, the trying to win in, in, in the marketplace of ideas. And you have to have free untrammeled conversation to do that. The best test in a democratic form of government and a democratic republic is the ability to get one's ideas accepted in the marketplace of ideas. That means that you can't censor or trammel that conversation. That in and of itself becomes a betrayal of the very form of government that you venerate. This is more of what we need to do um, and more of what we need to model where we can't ever expect that young people looking at what's happening on Twitter and other spaces are ever gonna be able to um, evolve beyond what we see today.
Thank you, Greg. I'm going to hand it back over to you to give some closing thoughts. Thank you, and thank you to this remarkable panel. One of the uh, disadvantages of a virtual presentation is that we cannot collectively rise and applaud the depth and precision and passion of this discussion, uh, but it certainly merits our fullest applause. The ancient Greeks built their system of democracy on the premise that any thesis met by an ant um, antithesis would invariably lead to a synthesis, and that this synthesis of thought was the best way to propel a society forward. Such has been the progress of this nation's history. It is uneven, it is imperfect, but this is ours, reflected in the depth and character of this discussion. I think this is what we must do, and what we have seen tonight is a splendid example of the wisdom of the ancient Greeks brought to bear by this brilliant panel for which we are incredibly grateful. We're grateful for everyone who has helped make this evening occur. Uh, David Welch, who's been a consultant to the project, Sarah Burke, who has uh, been in charge of logistics and communication. For more information regarding the Stubblefield Institute, its programs and its people, you can go to the website, www.stubblefieldinstitute.org. Um, we will always be here. We will continue to provide a forum where the best minds can come together on all sides of an issue and come up with synthesis. I think that's what's happened tonight. Thank you so much for sharing part of your evening with us. Thank you deeply to our panelists, to Sarah Isger, and thank you for the spirit behind this evening. Thanks all. Thank you.